Hello everyone and welcome back to our 30 day study challenge. Today is day 24 and today we're going to be talking about phylogenetic trees. We're going to be doing some basic overview and then some practice to so make sure you get your scratch paper so we can do some practice problems and really lock that knowledge in with some active studying. Be sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the days of our 30 day study challenge. If you stuck all the way through from the beginning, we are almost there. Congratulations. Let's keep going. So phylogeny is the study of evolutionary history and how organisms are related to each other. And a lot of what we talk about in evolutionary history and phylogeny is the idea that all organisms come from a single common ancestor. Now, when we talk about using phylogenetic trees, which are models to show these evolutionary relationships, sometimes we're actually gonna be using cladograms. Uh, you might've been taught that cladograms and phylogenetic trees are the same thing. There's actually a few differences between them, but knowing all the precise differences between the two is not something you're going to encounter in high school biology or even AP bio. So a cladogram might look like something you see here that's depicting the evolution of different types of plants, or it could be very complicated like this phylogenetic tree we see on the other side, which is all the members of the mycobacterium genus and how they're related to each other based on biochemical evidence. Usually in a phylogenetic tree, this is the branched one you see right here, the distance between two individuals is gonna to relate to time and how closely related certain species are. Cladograms, on the other hand, are mostly based on shared traits, not DNA or other biochemical evidence, and they're not gonna be drawn to scale. And not all phylogenetic trees are drawn to scale either. But for the purposes of this video, we're just gonna be talking about evolutionary trees in general, and you'll be able to see them, how to interpret them, and how to create your own. So like I said, these are tools or models used by scientists, so we can compare evolutionary history or relatedness between different organisms. So if it's a simple cladogram like this, we're gonna be grouping organisms based on the things they have in common. And usually when we're creating trees, if we're gonna be doing this on our own, we wanna create one that is the simplest explanation for how these traits could have evolved. That's called maximum parsimony. And it means that in most cases, a trait will usually evolve just one time instead of multiple times on multiple different branches. So if we go by that, then we wanna create the simplest possible explanation for how these organisms could be related to each other. And don't worry, you'll see what I mean in just a little bit. So in the past, phylogenetic trees used to be created just on shared traits, or morphological features, physical features that organisms had in common. Now we use lots of biochemical DNA evidence, similarities of different proteins, so the amino acid order in proteins of different organisms. And that's the data that's gonna go specifically into a phylogenetic tree. And we continue to refine these trees as we gather more evidence. And when we say they show relatedness, we're showing how recently two different species groups had a common ancestor. So if we look at this tree right here, again, ignoring the branch lengths for now, we see that each end point on the tree, A, B, and C, that's gonna represent a different species group. And the last time on this tree that A and C shared a common ancestor was at this branch point here on the tree. Sometimes on trees, you'll also see these synapomorphies or shared derived traits. And these can be marked by little hash marks on the tree. And any organism that appears after that trait is marked on the tree, has the trait or continues in their evolutionary history with that trait. So for example, on these ones, long wings is a trait that both species B and A have, but species C does not have. And a lot of these times these trees will be rooted. And what that means is there's gonna be this sort of continuing branch or part of the tree, and it's actually the root of the tree. And that is in reference to LUCA or the last universal common ancestor, which we think all living things share. So if we're looking at a tree like this, that is, has this type of branching pattern, remember that continued root that is in reference to the last universal common ancestor. And then this circle mark here, that is a speciation event or an event where these two different groups branched from each other. And as time goes on, on a phylogenetic tree, it will continue from where the ancestor arose. A lot of times these are not drawn to scale along a period of years or millions of years. Okay, so let's look at this plants one one more time. Um, you can see now we have an example where these traits appear on the cladogram. And so we see that mosses, ferns, pine trees, and flowery, flowering plants are all on this tree and they all arose from one common ancestor. Now, the last time mosses and flowering plants show, shared a common ancestor would have been at this branching point down here. And then vascular tissue, this is a shared derived trait that 
that only ferns, pine trees, and flowering plants share. The evolution of seeds occurred here at this point in the tree, so only pine trees and flowering plants have seeds, and then of course only flowering plants have flowers. Everything that branches from before this mark on the tree does not have that trait. So the best way to understand phylogenetic trees and cladograms, I think, is to practice them. So go ahead and get out some scratch paper, and we're going to be doing some practice problems together. All right, let's get started. So here we have another phylogenetic tree with a variety of different organisms. Um, and what I'm going to do is place some letters on the tree. Okay. And so which letter in the tree corresponds to the most recent common ancestor of yeast and the worm? Think about it. Correct answer is D. D would be that branch point where there would be a common ancestor between the worm and the yeast. All right, so now we're gonna have you draw your own tree, so make sure you do get that scratch paper out. And here we have a chart or a table of shared derived traits, and we have a bunch of different organisms, and then the plus sign indicates whether or not they have that trait. So what I want you to do is do your best to create a cladogram based on this table and show how all of these organisms could be related and where these traits appear on the cladogram. Take a second to pause the video and come back when you're ready. All right, here we go. So we'll start with our original branch, original line with our uh, common ancestor down here at the bottom. And we'll start with the lamprey because if we go back to our table, we can see that the lamprey actually did not have any of these traits. So that'll be the first organism on our phylogenetic tree. Followed by fish. Fish only had one of those characteristics in the table and that was the spinal column. So we can include spinal column here and everything that comes after that spinal column will also have that trait. We're working towards the simplest explanation po as possible when we're creating this. So we don't want to include, for example, the frogs before the fish because then we would have to add lungs and then take them away again on our tree diagram. All right, and then the rest of them come this way on the tree. Now remember, if we flip this and you had it going in the opposite direction, that's okay. As long as all the branching patterns still match up, you did this right. All right, here's another one, Clay to cre create another cladogram with the following information. So we have a shark, a bullfrog, a kangaroo, and a human. You notice on this table here, the organisms are at the top and the characters are on the, on the left. Uh, and go ahead and pause the video and work on this cladogram. All right, when you're ready, here we go. So we have all of the organisms here on our cladogram. We have human at the end. That does not mean that humans are like the most evolved species. Remember in evolution, there's no one ultimately evolved organism. These trees are continuously revised and species appear, arise and go extinct. And so, and so depending on how we're arranging things, this phylogenetic tree could look different with different organisms on it. All right. Um, now we just have some enzymes. So now we're comparing the similarities between organisms based on these enzymes that appear and whether or not they are in each organism. So we have four enzymes and three different species. So go ahead and create an evolutionary tree based on this data. When you're ready. All right, so here is one version of it. We see that species C had enzyme one, but none of the other enzymes. So enzyme one appeared first. Uh, then enzyme two and three are both present in species B and A. And species A has all of the enzymes present. So when we see species A appearing, we would have all the enzymes there already on the tree. All right, I hope that has been helpful in doing some phylogenetic tree practice. Tomorrow, we're gonna to be looking at some trees to describe the changes in life on Earth. We're gonna go through the history of life on Earth and see how living things are different from when they first arose on the planet. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.